Amen. But listen to this first statement on faith uh, by, by A.W. Tozer. If you can go to the next slide for me. Okay. Faith is the gaze of a soul upon a saving God. So Tozer said, faith is the gaze of a soul upon a saving God. It's to look upon God, to fix your eyes on Jesus, in other words. To put your faith in God, to gaze a soul. Are you seeing some stuff in here? <laughs> You're catching stuff here. Yeah. I mean, faith is the gaze of a soul upon a saving God. It's to put your gaze upon God, a saving God. In other words, God is your Savior. God is your provider. God is your healer. God is your uh, whatever you need. God is that. Amen. And you know, in the Bible, when they went through these different times, when they said Jehovah Jireh, it was at a time when God provided. The name came, God didn't say, I am Jehovah Jireh. They said, this is Jehovah Jireh. When God provided, they named him the God that provides. I mean, when they said, this is Jehovah Rapha, which means God my healer, it's because God healed, and they saw the evidence of it, and they said, oh, this is the God that heals. I mean, so you see how God, God's nature came through, and people could see God is not just a God of many words. God is a God of action. God is a God that acts His Word upon people. And if we can believe, and faith is the connection that will bring the action from the spiritual realm. Amen. How many of you believe that? It's time that the church walks in the signs, wonders, and the miracles of the book of Acts. How many of you know this? The church has for a long time been asking, where's all the signs? Where's all the wonders? Where's all the miracles? And then people got put off because there are some false prophets that will also make profits from these things. Amen. And see, God doesn't want it, but God has cleaned up His house now, and He's saying, it's time to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, that my sons and my daughters will prophesy. My old men will have dreams, and my young men will have visions. Amen. This is what the Lord wants to do in these days. He wants to open up our understanding to His Word. He wants to give us the power that's available from the Spirit. But what your side is, is faith. If you don't have faith, if you don't believe that God is able to do that, and not just the belief that God is able, but to know the God of the miracle. Let me say that again. You need to know the God of the miracle. You need to know the God of the miracle. You need to have intimacy with God. My marriage is lasting 22 years so far, and it's going to last another 55 years or longer. Amen. I'll be 100 and whatever. I don't know how old I'll be, but I'll, no, I'll be 99. I'll be 99, actual fact, in 55 years' time. I'll be 99, and my marriage will still last because I have intimacy with my wife. We speak regularly, we communicate with each other, we share our fears with one another, we share our thoughts with one another, we go on the marriage course and there you, you learn some things about your emotions and how to share your emotions and all these things. That is how you talk to God, that is how God begins to speak into your life and begins to infiltrate every part of your life. It is not a religion, Christianity is a relationship. I want to say that over and over again, if you're going to build a religion, you might as well go and dance in the rain somewhere for some God that doesn't hear you. Amen? God wants you in a relationship with Him as much as He wanted Adam and Eve to have this relationship with Him because He created them for that relationship, so He wants that relationship with you. And you know what? God made it possible through His Son, Jesus. Possible through Jesus. And so let's move on from there. Tozer said, faith is to gaze. Upon a, soul, a soul to gaze upon a saving God. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 to 17. We're going to read that passage of Scripture tonight. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. How many of you know that the Bible brings good things? Next, next part, verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, Corin, and hearing by the word of God. Now I want to give you tonight seven steps to have gospel faith. Quickly, seven steps. You need to take a picture of this. You need to put it in your diary somewhere. You need to put it on your wall somewhere. You need to put it on your spiritual list somewhere. The gospel of faith. How to have the gospel of faith. Seven steps to walk in this gospel of faith. This is practical steps. It's not just spiritual things. It's not just to say, oh, well, these are the seven steps to a better life. No, no, no. This is a little bit deeper than that. This is not the step to home improvement. This is not the step to, to have, have a better haircut. This is not those type of steps, or look better when you come out with the best outfit. Now, which outfits go together? Which colors go together? Not those type of steps. 
This is not quick steps. These are things that you need to apply in your life. And so the first one is in verse 14. What does verse 14 say? Verse 14 says, How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? Okay, you don't have to go back there. The gospel is given by Christ. The gospel, the centrality of the gospel is Jesus. The gospel is not just power. You see, we can quote the scripture. We can even idolize the gospel. How many of you know that? When we say the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, many times we, we focus on the power. It's the power of salvation. We want to see people get saved. But don't forget the Christ of the salvation. Don't forget that Jesus is central to the gospel. There are other gospels being preached today. How many of you know that? The Bible speaks of other gospels. How many of you know that the Bible says if you preach another gospel, a curse will come upon you? That's New Testament. Isn't it hectic? A curse will come upon you if you preach another gospel. In other words, if you misrepresent who the gospel is about, if the gospel is about giving good gifts. How many of you know there's a gospel of um, good works? Yeah? Prosperity. There's many different gospels that have been preached that are representing different things, but it's not representing Jesus. The centrality of the gospel is that man was in the garden and the garden was a perfect place and man fell and sin came into the world and it separated us from God. And God sent the law so that the law can lead us like a school teacher, like a tutor until Jesus can come. And when Jesus comes, he will fulfill the law completely, not break the law, not demolish the law, not take the law away, but fulfill the law so that we can also fulfill the law in Christ Jesus under his blood. Because when we're under the blood, we are in perfection. How many of you know that? When we're in perfection before God, He says, now the law is fulfilled in you. Now you stand by grace because you put your faith in what Jesus has done. Now you're not saved by works, but you're saved by grace. Isn't it wonderful that God would send Jesus to restore relationship with Him so that you and I can say, what is this? The gospel given by Christ. The second one is, second step is the gospel must be preached. Mm, we can't be quiet. Come on, the, the gospel must be preached. Sometimes we, we, we shrink back from preaching the gospel. There must be someone preaching the gospel. The gospel must be preached. The Bible speaks about go and preach the gospel to all nations. Make disciples. How do you do that without speaking? You need to preach the gospel. For you to preach the gospel, you need to understand the Christ of the gospel to articulate it well. If I want to tell you about my wife, I can tell you, Days and days and days of information about my wife. Why is that? Now you say, why do you keep using the relationship with your wife? Do you know that Ephesians chapter 5 used the relationship between husband and wife as Christ and the bride? You see, beautiful. He knew that our relationship here needs to reflect the relationship of the church with Jesus. Our relationship with other people needs to reflect the relationship that Christ has with the church. Isn't that a wonderful but that's why I keep saying, I can tell you about my wife for days. I can tell you all the secrets. I can tell you all the great things about her. I can tell you all the, the weaknesses, the strengths, the hurts, the pains, the struggles, the things. Why? Because we spent hours and hours and days and months and years talking to one another and listening and investing and spending time together in each other's presence. Now... How many of you, when you sit down and you talk to people, what comes out of you is that intimacy with Christ? It bubbles over because you can't help it. You've just spent time with Him last night. You just spent time with Him this morning. You just spent time with Him in church tonight. Amen? And that intimacy, when you actually, that's why Matthew chapter 6 says, close your door. Because you can't have a conversation in a public place on your phone. Huh? You can't be in a public place and have intimacy with Christ. You have to go to a place where you're isolated. We need to be in quarantine with God. We need to go back into lockdown with Jesus. Amen? That's where we need to go back, back into a lockdown position so that it's only you and Jesus so you can actually hear of the things that's going on in your life. Do you know that God knows everything about you? He knows every hair on your head. He knows everything about your baddest thoughts that you've ever had. He knows everything about you. He knows what you thought today, Gordon. He knows what you were up to today. He knows that you're driving your wife crazy. <laughs> With love, huh? There we go. <laughs> Gordon. Amen. Let's move on from there. 
A preacher is necessary. The preacher must be sent. How many of you know that God sends you? I want to say tonight that over each one of you that God sends you out into the world to be a preacher, to be a light, to be a witness, to carry the light of Jesus Christ, to carry the gospel. Wherever you're in your workplace, in your family, in your neighborhood, you've been sent. You've been sent to that place. Do you know that Jesus used the pulpit wherever he was? Do you know Jesus, when even when he was, on a, when he was standing and the crowd got too, too much pushing against him, what did he do? Got into a boat and said, push it a little bit further out. Jesus used the boat as a pulpit. Come, some of us wait for an opportunity to stand on the stage to share with people. You have Facebook, you have Instagram, you have Twitter, you have TikTok, you have Snapchat. How many platforms do you need to witness to people? Rather use it for that than for other stuff. Lots of other stuff. Let's not get into that tonight. Okay. So the preacher must be sent. The gospel must be heard. The gospel must be believed. Verse 16. There's the key. Unless I believe what Christ has done for me, there's no change in my life. I want to show you something tonight. The Lord gave me revelation as we were in worship out of the book of Acts. Amazing, isn't it how the Holy Spirit works? I'm going to take you to the book of Acts. I'm going to take you to chapter 8 just now after this. The gospel must be obeyed, the last one. There's only blessing and obedience. You see, we can say yes, 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 yes here tonight. We can say, yes, I'm going to do it. Yes, I'm going to share with people. Yes, I'm going to love God. Yes, I'm going to spend intimate time with God. Remember when we started Wednesday nights, what was the call? Five minutes of prayer a day. We basically on like 20 probably by now. It's not about the time. Look, you're 10 minutes. Can, someone that spends, sometimes it takes you like 10 minutes just to get rid of all the thoughts of the day that you've been. You go into that prayer closet and your head's full of work, your head's full of family, your head's full of finances, your head's full of struggle, your head's full of pain, your head's full of stuff. And you first take like a while before you really settle down and start to listen and begin to speak and begin to read the word. You need to get to that place. You see, because when you rush... It's like, oh, what's the word of the day? Oh, they sent it to me on, on you version. Thank you. There's it. Word of the day. Blah, 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 blah. Thank you, Father. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. There you go. Listen, let me tell you. If you're going to build any relationship like that, you're not going to go very far. My wife would not be happy if I blah, 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 blah every day. Okay, 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 get it over. Tell me, tell me quickly, quickly, quickly. Liesl, two seconds, two seconds. Your time is up. There I'm going out the door. Do you think our marriage is going to last? Do you think, how come we, we think that type of relationship with God works? God's not happy with that time. God is appalled with that time. God's like, yeah, the Holy Spirit must be thinking like, reject it again. Huh? Why? There we go. Finish for the day. Tick box. I've done it. My five second for the day. Two minute word for the day. Thank you for that email that I get every day. Two minutes a day. Keeps the Holy Spirit away. Hmm. Now, some of you say, oh, you're a bit hard on us. But at the end of the day, I think if we're really serious about God, why wouldn't you want to spend time with Him? Get into that place. Settle down when you get home tonight even, if you have time. If you're not tired when you get home tonight. Some of you look very tired sitting here, I can promise you. I felt tired before I came. Huh? I feel rejuvenated when I come here. I'm like, yes, fill me up, Lord. And I'm going to go home, I crash. <laughs> Let's go, to, let's, let's go to Revelation, Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 8. Not the book of Revelation, Acts chapter 8. I want to read you something quickly. Are you with me? Okay. Let's go to Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Now, this is where Philip was ministering to these people, and the signs and the wonders and stuff was following Philip. Now, you know Philip was the guy that got to the river and baptized the guy, and then he appeared in the next town. I'm looking forward to that day. I've read testimonies of guys that were transported like that. In the, not in the spirit, in the flesh. <laughs> That's not like astral projection, this. This is like Kevin disappearing now and he's in this patch just now. He gets there into the town hall and he says, you know, the town hall is full tonight. What's happening here? No, we've been waiting for you. Kevin goes, okay, I'm going to preach the gospel. Hmm? It's happened in China to missionaries that were running away from the government. They went behind the curtain and they appeared in the next town. Because they were persecuted. 
It happened to a, to a missionary that went into an airport once, into the toilets, and he came out in the other toilets in the other city. Philip, if it happens in the Bible, it can happen now. Do you believe that? I'm not chasing after these things. I'm saying they will begin to happen naturally as the Lord wills. As the Lord wills. I'm looking forward to that day. Thank you, Jesus. Some of you are desiring these type of things to happen too. Lord, then I don't have to pay petrol. Can you transport me to work this morning? <laughs> Some of you need to start praying for a Philip anointing upon yourself. She's zoop, zoop, behind your desk. You see, how did you get here, Julius? No, 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 I just got transported in, this, in, in body. I just got like, I don't know. I just prayed, Lord, the petrol price. Zoop, zoop. Thank you, Lord. My car's at home. The kids are staying at home, but I'm at work at least, eh? <laughs> Imagine your kids in the car. They're ready to go. You're already at work. You're like, okay, sorry, guys. You need to find a way to work today. Ask mom to take you. <laughs> Dad's at work already. Zoop, zoop. Amen. Call it the zoop, zoop anointing. Amen. <laughs> Acts chapter 8, verse 14 says this. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, what did they receive? What did we just speak about? The gospel receiving the word. Okay, it's not on these slides, eh? You're not going to find it there. You can go back to the previous one now. So they heard the gospel. Thank you. So the gospel, they heard the gospel. They heard the word. They received the word. They believed it. They then sent Peter and John to them. On the arrival, they prayed for them to receive what? Holy Spirit. Okay, listen to this. For the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. You see, we believe in, in the work of grace. We believe in salvation is the first work of grace. We believe that there's also sanctification, and we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a third, third work of, 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 of grace. Amen? You see, in the book of Acts, sometimes it happened together. At other times, people got saved, and later they get baptized in the Holy Spirit. You see what I'm saying? So listen to this. Now I'm going to get to the part. They received the Holy Spirit when Peter and John did what? Laid their hands. How many of you have laid faith by faith your hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit? Paul did it. Peter did it. John did it. Come on, we can do that. But Peter, listen to this. When Simon saw, who's Simon? The sorcerer. He's the one working for the devil. Okay. Saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. He offered them money. He wants to pay for the Holy Spirit power. Give me this power as well, he said, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. He's like acting all Christian now. But Peter replied, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in our ministry because your heart is not right before God. What's the next word? Verse 22. Repent therefore of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps He will forgive you for the intent of your heart. For I say that you are poisoned by bitterness and captive to iniquity. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. And after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many of the Samaritan villages. As I, the Lord took me to the scripture during worship, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. Why is God taking me here? The reason for it is, listen to this. The reason why many people are not, not being baptized in the Holy Spirit is the same reason that Simon, the sorcerer, did not receive the Holy Spirit. Why? Because his heart was not right with God. And the only way to fix your heart with God is to repent. Now, the word in Afrikaans is om te bekeer, to turn. Turn away from sin. And turn towards God. The minute that you repent is the minute that you're ready to receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I'm also saying that when I read this, it's like my, my spiritual eyes went, Jush. wow. Okay. So what did he say? For I see, verse 23, that you have poisoned, you have been poisoned by bitterness and captive to iniquity. This is what he said to Simon the sorcerer. You can see that Simon's got bitterness in him. What does bitterness lead to? What is unforgiveness is leads to bitterness. Amen? The root of unforgiveness. So when you walk in a place of unforgiveness towards people, you walk in a place with the wrong posture in your heart, the Holy Spirit can't use you. I need more amens. 
Now, we don't take these things seriously. We don't put ourselves in the right posture before God because God looks at the posture of the heart. He doesn't look at how good you look on the outside and He goes, hmm, your heart is mooi gekom vandag. I think I should give you the Holy Spirit. I think I should give you a word for someone. I think you should go out and deliver. I think you should go out and preach. I think you should go out and minister to people. No, He looks at your heart's condition and your posture of your heart and your attitude and your relationships and are you living in a place of sin and iniquity and then the Holy Spirit will either feel welcome or He won't feel welcome. Amen? So this was like a key for me. I said, wow, Lord, thank you. So we need to come right with God through repentance. Repentance means the word metanoia means to turn 180 degrees. To turn from the stuff you're playing with here in the devil's camp. Playing with the devil to turn around and say, Lord, I need to come to the cross. I need to die to myself. I need to begin to live for you. I need to repent of the stuff I used to do. I need to repent of my thought life. Who can say amen to that? Come on. My thought life used to be bad. Seriously. You know what? What happened in the early days of my marriage? I confessed everything to my wife. Mm, tough, eh? <laughs> my wife would even warn me against some woman. See that woman? I don't trust her. Stay away from her. I said, yes, ma'am. Elijah, know, you know, Elijah knew what to, how to run from Jezebel. He didn't face Jezebel first. He first ran to the cave. God had to go fetch him in the cave and say to him, what are you doing here? Go back the way you came. After that, only could Elijah face Jezebel when the Lord encouraged him and the Lord gave him a word. Then he knew what to do. Now he had the boldness. You see, sometimes you need to run. <laughs> Get out of the environment. Get out of the place. Get off the site. Stop listening to that music you're listening to that is filthy music. Listen, some, listen sometimes you're on TikTok and stuff and there's, there's bad music in there. Really bad music with really bad words, with really bad derogatory words towards women. Hmm? The beat's going and you like shaking the head and the body starts shaking, but you, you forget about the words that you're listening to and it infiltrates your mind. And your posture and your heart begins to change towards God and you wonder why it's so tough for you to worship in church. You wonder why it's so tough for God to use you because the Holy Spirit does not force Himself into your life. He looks at the posture of your heart. He looks at the motive of your heart. He looks at the place you're in with God relationship, and the Holy Spirit will either feel welcome, or he'll say, no, 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 no. Liesl, you haven't forgiven your mother yet. You need to go back. Say, sorry, mama. I love you. I forgive you. Forgive me, please, actually. You know, the worst thing is when someone comes to you, I forgive you! <laughs> that person goes, for what? <laughs> they didn't even know what you forgive. <laughs> You sound angry too. <laughs> Dear Lord, I forgive you. Hey, thank you, Lord, I did it. So, I showed him. The devil's more angry with me now. No, oh, now I know that you've got unforgiveness towards me. And I said, like, just soften this thing. Sometimes the Lord doesn't lead you to, to go speak to the person. Sometimes he releases you by not going. But he does sometimes say, I can't release you until you forgive that person. Until you let go. Amen.